Now we are going to apply a triaxial stress regime on the cube. So here sigma 1 1 is given by sigma 1, sigma 2 2 is given by sigma 2, sigma 3 3 is given by sigma 3 and no shear stresses are applied on the cube. So we will expect that due to the application of only the normal stress, only the normal strains will be produced. We have seen in terms of three different matrices if sigma 1 is produced how much are the corresponding these terms if sigma 2 is only applied what are the terms and if sigma 3 is only applied what are the terms so if three of them are applied what will happen the epsilon 1 here will be the sum of all those three individual cases which is given by sigma 1 by e minus nu by e multiplied by sigma 2 plus sigma 3 epsilon 2 will be represented by sigma 2 by e minus nu by e sigma 1 plus sigma 3 and epsilon 3 for the triaxial stress regime will be given by sigma 3 divided by e minus nu by e sigma 1 plus sigma 2. So these three equations can be summarized in this way. Here epsilon ij I am reading first is equal to 1 plus nu divided by e sigma ij minus nu by e sigma kk delta ij. Here sigma kk is the Einstein summation and the delta ij is basically the Kronecker delta that means if i equal to j that means for delta 1 1 or 2 2 or 3 3 it is 1 if i is not equal to j that means delta 1 2 or 2 3 etc it will be 0. Now I am going to put i equal to j equal to 1 and I am going to check whether I am going to get this equation or not. If I put here epsilon 1 1 that is basically our epsilon 1 that is what I write epsilon 1 1 is equal to epsilon 1 is equal to 1 plus nu divided by e this becomes sigma 1 1 minus nu by e as it is now this will be expanded sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 that is what I write multiplied by delta 1 1. Now for delta 1 1 this is basically 1 sigma 3 3 we are writing here as sigma 3 sigma 2 2 as sigma 2 and sigma 1 1 as sigma 1. So this equation simplifies to epsilon 1 equal to and now you can compare with this and this they have become the same equation. If you simplify this you will get back to epsilon 1. In this way by putting i equal to j equal to 2 you can get epsilon 2 and this expression by putting i equal to j equal to 3 you will be getting epsilon 3 equal to this expression. By taking i not equal to j such as epsilon 1 2 epsilon 2 3 all those shear stresses are based, shear strains are basically 0. If we put i not equal to j and apply the formula remember that Kronecker delta if it is here epsilon 2 3 it will be delta 2 3 and for delta 2 3 it will become 0. So this entire term will become 0 and in this way we can show that for the applied and here if it is epsilon 2 3 the stress will be sigma 2 3 now no sigma 2 3 was applied so this is also 0 in turn everything becomes 0 so all these shear stress terms become equal to 0. So now with this understanding with this understanding we can write the Hooke's law for the isotropic material under triaxial stress regime in a matrix format epsilon 1 epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 equal to then these terms are picked up E inverse minus new E inverse minus new E inverse minus new E inverse E inverse and minus new E inverse minus new E inverse minus new E inverse and E inverse and here sigma 1 sigma 2 and sigma 3. If we open up this matrix and write down individual equations we are going to get these three equations. So what we understand is that this can be simplified as epsilon and this 
symbol indicating this matrix is equal to D this matrix multiplied by sigma the stress matrix over here. Now this D matrix is called commonly as a compliance matrix it is symmetric you can see that these terms are the same and these terms are the same that means if I do a D transpose it will be same as the D and this D matrix consists of only two independent coefficients the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. Now we can further work with this, this equation basically three equations which is stated there or these three equations which is stated here can also be written as stress is equal to D inverse and then the strain. That means this D is brought at this side at this side by doing an inverse of the matrix. So that matrix if it is calculated we can call it C and this is known as the material stiffness matrix. And now if we do such an, such an activity take it over there and do an inverse and then we can find out sigma 1 will take this form lambda plus 2g multiplied by epsilon 1 plus lambda epsilon 2 plus lambda epsilon 3. Now what is lambda? Lambda is equal to nu e divided by 1 plus nu multiplied by 1 minus 2 nu. This lambda is known as the lem constant and here was a term g involved this g this is also sometimes written in some book as mu mu or g is equal to e divided by 2 multiplied by 1 plus nu this is known as the shear modulus also known as the coulomb modulus it has importance in the materials property. So now if I ask you having said this if I give you some values of e realistic value for the rock let us say 10 to the power mega Pascal and I give you the value of nu is equal to 0 0.22 you have to basically calculate the D matrix from here find out the D matrix that means the 9 elements you have to write in that way take these exercises seriously if you do not do if you just keep on watching the lecture it will not work E and nu are given find out the D and after you have found the D can you find out the C the material stiffness matrix it will be a bit lengthy exercise but it will be worth doing find out the D matrix and with this says with the same data set find out the C matrix as well. Note here this expression can also be written as lambda epsilon v multiplied by 2 g and epsilon 1 what is uh, what is epsilon v here epsilon v I have stated here this epsilon v is given by sum of the all the normal strains epsilon 1 1 epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 3 3 summed up. So this is the epsilon v that is written here similar expression for sigma 2 and sigma 3 can also be stated. Now I if I request the students can you represent this equation this equation and this equation in terms of a single equation it is very easy lambda epsilon v plus 2g epsilon i this is one way and i is equal to 1 this one equation i equal to 2 second equation and i equal to 3 is the third equation. Now if you want to use i i that is also possible you can use in continuation let us have a look capital K modulus of incompressibility also known as bulk modulus is given by E divided by 3 multiplied by 1 minus 2 nu which is same as 3 lambda plus 2 g divided by 3 this capital K and this g are always more than 0 and as nu the Poisson's ratio approaches 0.5 K keeps on increasing you can check it over here and when nu is nearly equal to 0.5 we say that the material has become almost incompressible the material is moving towards more and more incompressible nature. The epsilon v the volumetric strain can be stated as the sum of the applied normal stresses here divided by 3 lambda plus 2 g. Now this is same as basically the trace and then 3 lambda plus 2 g is taken care by 3 k because I have told here k is equal to this. 
Now this stress of this stress divided by 3 is the mean stress sigma m. So this epsilon b becomes sigma m divided by capital K. Commonly for the rocks the Poisson's ratio nu is 0.25 and in that case there are remember here we are not dealing with the layered rocks we have considered isotropic rocks which is can be found in nature in specific cases but not always. So there must be some way of improving these equations to deal with the rheology of the more realistic rocks. Okay, another thing we have already just now deduced the relationship between the strain matrix then the matrix D and the stress matrix and we, that is for the triaxial stress regime where the triaxial strain also has been produced. Now if you put any one of them in sigma 1, sigma 2 or sigma 3, any one of them equal to 0 then the thing that you get is basically the biaxial stress regime and the biaxial strain regime. I will request you to write down this equation in detail when there is a biaxial stress regime as well. What about the uniaxial stress regime that we have already done. When we were doing this triaxial stress regime deduction we considered three separate uniaxial stress regimes and then we compiled them and then we got. So the uniaxial is already done, triaxial is derived and from there we are also commenting that biaxial stress regime can be worked out. Now we are going to see a more generalized forms of the statement of the Hooke's law. Here we say that each stress component can be expressed or represented as a linear combination of all the strain component. Let us try to understand sigma x or sigma xx or sigma 1 1 which can be considered as a linear combination of all the strains that are produced. I will explain slowly. D11 is a, const, is a constant for the material epsilon x is the strain produced along the x direction. So in this way d1 to epsilon y, what is epsilon y? Epsilon y is epsilon yy or the epsilon 2 2, the epsilon the strain perpendicular to plane 2 and along the axis 2 in that sense. Similarly d13 epsilon z then so these three epsilon x, epsilon y and epsilon z are the normal strain. After that comes the gamma xy, gamma yz, gamma yx, gamma yz and gamma xz. These gamma terms are all the shear strain and they are associated with these numbers d16, d17, d18 they are multiplied and a linear combination is made. This is the general statement of the Hooke's law. So here what has happened? the applied stress along the x axis can produce strain in all directions along the direction 1, 2 and 3 as normal strain and also on the 1, 2 plane, 2, 3 plane and on the 1, 3 plane. Similarly sigma y which means basically sigma yy or which means sigma 2, 2 that can also be represented as d21 or d21 epsilon x and similar terms up to d29 gamma xz. Similarly the sigma z again a normal stress it can be expressed as a linear combination of strain in all the directions. Now the shear stress tau xy can also be represented in this way where all these strains are happening. So this material is not behaving in an isotropic manner this is a case of an anisotropic material. Similarly tau yx can be written, tau yz can be written, tau zy can be written, tau xz can be written in terms of a linear combination of strain in various directions. And the last expression here you can see it is d91 and it goes up to d99. So these so many equations, how many equations? 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 equations. These 9 equations can be stated in this matrix format sigma ij which is called as the stress component matrix given by these terms is equal to dij. dij is called as the stiffness matrix. In other literature it has been called as an elasticity matrix. Also it has been called as a constitutive matrix. It is a 9 into 9 matrix which means that there are 81 elements within this dij. 
Let's try to see whether there are 81 indeed. From here D11 to D19, we are getting so many elements. There is no element like D20. You can see it starts with D21 and it will end at D29. Then it will start at D31 and it will end at D39. In this way, it starts at D91 and it ends at D99. So therefore, you cannot say that 99 minus 11 is the number of element. That is not correct. So if you count properly, it will be 81 coefficients or elements present. 9 into 9 matrix. And if we do an inverse of Dij, that is Cij, that will also have a 9 into 9, that's also a 9 into 9 matrix with 81 elements. Now one thing we have to understand, why are we calling Dij matrix as a stiffness matrix or an elasticity matrix? This needs to be explained. Recollect the simplest case that there is a spring and we are pulling with a low amount of stress, not so high that the material can snap. In that situation, the Hooke's law we have studied from school days, stress is equal to Young's modulus multiplied by strain. This is the simplest uniaxial case and no shear stress is acting. This is the one. This can be compared. Sigma ij is comparable with sigma. Dij is comparable with Young's modulus y and epsilon ij, the matrix is comparable with a single value of epsilon. Now here, I have already explained that higher the Young's modulus, stiffer the material is, more difficult is to deform the body. So here, that is the purpose why this word stiffness or elasticity is coming up. If the elements of this matrix, these numbers, d11, d12, d13, d18, etc., getting higher, that means the body is more difficult to deform. For example, sigma x is equal to so many terms. If d11, d12, d13, all these terms are higher, the body will be more difficult to deform along these directions, giving to the respective strain. So that is why this has been called as a stiffness matrix. And that is why the inverse of Dij is Cij is not called as a stiffness matrix. Now this matrix, what was stated in short form can be expanded, how it will look like. Normal stresses, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z and the shear stresses 1, 2, 3 and 4, 5, 6 are given. Now all these coefficients d11, d12, etc. have been written 1, 1 up to 19, 2, 1 up to 29 and it goes up to 9, 1 up to 99. There are 9 equations, so starting with 1, 2 and then there is the number 9. We can see it is a 9 into 9 matrix with 81 elements within it. Now here, to fulfill that equation, we have to write epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z. Here it is tau xy, so it is gamma xy, tau yz, so it is gamma yz, tau zx, so gamma zx, tau yx, so tau yx, tau zy, therefore gamma zy, tau xz, therefore gamma xz. So this is the form. Now, when the small cube on which we are applying the stress is not rotating. In that case, I have told you, it can be proved from the study of the moments that tau ij equal to tau ji. And in that case, gamma ij equal to gamma ji for i not equal to j. That means we are talking essentially about these shear stress components here and these shear strain components in this equation. So if they are equal, then we can see certain elements in the matrix are going to be repetitive. So this matrix can be chopped out to a useful, meaningful portion. So I will keep sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, tau xy, tau yz, tau zx and here I can give a cut. And I can say that since these numbers are repeating, these numbers are repeating, so these d1, d2 parameters, not d1, d2, but maybe d51, d56, etc., those parameters, these and these are basically repeating. Since they are repeating, so this will be dropped. There is no need to write, and it is also difficult to write. You see, such a matrix writing also difficult. So, for practical purpose, this portion will be dropped, and only this portion will be retained. We will carry forward from here and we will see what more can be done. 
when we were avoiding these portions there are certain portions here also are to be avoided for example i am saying from this sigma x equal to d11 epsilon x plus d12 epsilon y it will go up to d16 gamma zx so d16 onwards d17 d18 and d19 will be useless here because these three are not used so d17 d18 and d19 are not used similarly here d21 d22 it will go up to d26 and beyond which d27 d28 and d29 will not be used so basically once we are chopping down we need only this portion of the d matrix how many elements are here 11 to 16 we have got 6 and here we have got 1 2 3 4 5 6 so 6 multiplied by 6 equal to 36 elements will be carried forward we will take it forward let's look at the generalized hooks law in more detail this is the equation that i was talking about now if there is a symmetry condition that sigma ij equal to sigma j i for i not equal to j and the gamma ij equal to gamma j i for i not equal to j in that case actually these d individual elements symmetric relationship appears and there are symmetric repetition so instead of writing the entire d matrix i have drawn a right angle triangle here and i am writing it as symmetric and by saying so we are finally having only 21 independent material constant dij now a special kind of an anisotropic material can be called as an orthotropic material in that case many of these d parameters inside become zero d14 d15 d16 d24 d25 d26 d34 d35 d36 d45 d46 and d56 become zero so i will request the students that you fill up this d22 after that will be d23 up to d26 you write down and take these parameters as zero and please write this equation for the orthotropic material in this format the stress terms then the d matrix here i am writing as s for symmetric and what i am asking you to basically fill up this portion it is possible to do and this strain parameters will be within the second bracket as usual now a special kind of orthotropic material is called isotropic material besides this being happening then we find that these two d elements are the same then d11 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 goes here here d11 minus d12 by 2 d11 minus d12 by 2 and d11 minus d12 divided by 2 from where we are getting from the experimental data in the laboratory we can find out that such a situation can arise and here only d11 and d12 are the two dij non-zero parameters and rest of the d terms have become zero this part again remains as symmetric okay so we will now move ahead with this uh, d matrix here observe that we are dealing with an isotropic material sigma ii does not contribute to tau ij no this tau will be gamma gamma ij when i is not equal to j this means that when it is a normal stress sigma 1 1 it does not contribute to any of the shear stresses that's what i am writing normal stress does not lead to shear strain this is shear strain does not lead to shear strain and for sigma ij for, for i not equal to j that means sigma 1 2 sigma 2 3 those are the shear stresses or epsilon i i that means the normal strain so this is the main point of difference between the isotropic and the anisotropic material in anisotropic material i take a let's say cube shaped anisotropic material and apply a normal stress there can be shear stresses generated on the surface of the cube but here it will not be so and vice versa also now what are the physical meaning of this d11 d12 and why did we write like that from the laboratory experiments we can find that d12 is basically the limb constant lambda and d11 minus d12 divided by 2 is equal to g so from here we can say that d11 is equal to 2g plus lambda so we can take this and that and we will be replacing these 
d11 d12 within the matrix by these two expressions once that is done 2g plus lambda that goes here and then g g and g these are lambda and then rest of the terms here are zero so this is one another way of presenting the isotropic material when i started today the discussion on there is a cube and watching on a plan view and i have pulled it okay then we deduced a stiffness matrix compliance matrix and then we also expanded the term sigma means sigma 1 means sigma 1 1 means what so basically we have come back to that place only d is equal to this this is like going back to that uh, matrix and what was started with initial case so we started initially with the case of isotropic material then we came into anisotropic material orthotropy and a special kind of orthotropy we have considered the isotropic material some special cases of the d i j parameters and based on that finally we have come to the isotropic known expression and again we will we have many more things to speak about one simple exercise for the students can be given consider sigma capital h sigma small h and sigma v are the in situ stresses in a uniaxial strain regime so let's explain what it means capital h means that this axis is horizontal this small h also means this axis is horizontal so then why is the difference in the symbol capital h and small h the relation is this sigma h may be equal to sigma small h but it is also possible that sigma capital h is more than sigma small h and sigma v means the principal stress axis which is vertical so what it means altogether that there are two horizontal principal stress axis another is vertical essentially we are talking an andersonian stress regime in this case if if there is a uniaxial strain also occurring that means along only one direction strain is happening for some reason that means we have to take epsilon x and epsilon y equal to 0 so that epsilon z is not equal to 0 in that case you are supposed to prove sigma h is equal to sigma h so this is a special case when both of them become equal is equal to nu divided by 1 minus nu multiplied by sigma v so we know these formulae note that there is no shear stresses acting so this is the formula of strain and stress relationship here we have written the formula in terms of sigma x sigma z sigma y everywhere whereas we have given here sigma h sigma h and sigma v so you have to carefully change this sigma x y and z into sigma h h and v and also consider these two let's say are zero so this is 0 and that is also 0 do the algebra and come to this formula and this is an important one is used in engineering geology a lot already I have discussed about a compact equation where the three equations can be represented for isotropic material as epsilon ij is where epsilon ij is equal to this much and where delta ij is the Kronecker delta and sigma kk is basically the Einstein summation. Now I am posing a question, how about writing this in this way sigma ij equal to lambda epsilon kk delta ij which is the Kronecker delta and this is the Einstein summation plus 2g and then epsilon ii. This is not the final one I am asking you to think is this correct or if any correction is required let's take i equal to j equal to 1 then it is sigma 1 1 or it is sigma 1 is equal to lambda and this expands 1 1 2 2 and 3 3 now we can change the symbols we can call epsilon 1 1 as epsilon x epsilon 2 2 as epsilon y epsilon 3 3 as epsilon z and this delta 1 1 since i equal to j will be equal to 1 so this becomes delta multiplied by sum of these three things plus 2g and epsilon y1 is replaced by epsilon 1 1 is replaced by epsilon x so by doing so we can write we can also replace it by sigma x sigma x is equal to this and this looks to be correct but the problem is that with this equation if i am putting i equal to x and j equal to y am i going back to the proper form of sigma xy equal to 
what comes out from the matrix i am asking you to cross check is this correct or any correction is required for you to think about the generalized hooks law has been stated in terms of a matrix and now there are other interesting ways of presenting such as sigma ij equal to cij kl epsilon kl where ij kl will vary from 1 to 3 1 2 and 3 are the possible values let's try to understand how it can be so consider i equal to j equal to 1 so we are going to see sigma 1 1 so by putting i equal to j equal to 1 in cij kl it becomes c11 kl epsilon kl and now we are going to expand it c11 is as it is in k and l we have put 1 and 1 so if i put in k equal to 1 l equal to 1 epsilon kl becomes epsilon 1 1 next instead of 1 1 i am putting 2 and 1 so correspondingly the epsilon values the suffix will be 2 1 then i am putting 3 1 and therefore there is 3 1 now 1 1 2 1 and 3 1 are over 1 1 2 1 and 3 1 as kl values are over now i am taking 1 2 so epsilon 1 2 2 2 and then kl values as 3 2 and 3 2 so i have finished with 1 2 2 2 and 3 2 next i am going to see the kl values as 1 and 3 then so this is epsilon 1 and 1 3 kl values 2 3 so epsilon 2 3 and then kl value 3 and 3 so epsilon is 3 and 3 so 1 3 2 3 and 3 3 are also done and once it is expanded we can see for the anisotropic material sigma 1 1 is equal to such a linear combination of all the uh, strain in different ways some of them are normal strain some of them are shear strain as well now similarly one can write the way i have done for sigma 1 1 all other sigma ij can be expressed so in this way it is explained that the generalized hooks law can be also presented for anisotropic material as sigma ij equal to cij kl multiplied by epsilon kl now let's see this relation sigma ij equal to cij kl epsilon kl what happens if the cube is not rotating that is the case when what we call as the stress symmetry condition sigma ij equal to sigma ji if that is true then instead of i i will put j instead of j i will put i i will write cji equal to cij becomes cji and then kl remains kl and epsilon kl remains as it is further i say we say that sigma ij equal to sigma ji so these two are equal therefore cij kl has to be equal to cji kl and that's what i am writing here now from the strain symmetry generally we wrote, write that epsilon ij equal to epsilon ji so what it means epsilon kl will be equal to epsilon lk now what will happen if i write instead of cij kl epsilon kl i write epsilon lk then it will be cij lk that's what i am writing here sigma ij equal to cij lk epsilon lk so from equation 4 and equation 1 if i equate them then what happens cij kl become same as the cij lk so we have got two interesting relations when the material when the cube does not rotate and by doing this these c parameters are greatly reduced in number and they become 36 comes back to the isotropic uh, situation where i have already explained that there are 36 independent elements within the d matrix which is here cij kl elements are filling up the d matrix now let's look at the hooks law in another way sigma i equal to cij multiplied by epsilon j and here i and j runs from 1 to 6 the the moment we are saying that i and j are running from 1 to 6 this means that we are dealing with a case where the sigma ij equal to sigma j i and tau ij equal to tau j i so instead of writing 9 into 9 matrix we are writing 6 into 6 matrix now here before putting i and j 1 2 3 4 5 6 we will do soon 
first understand that there are certain other conditions. After putting these values, there are some transformation table is to be used. Sigma 1, whatever we get, we have to uh, treat it as sigma 1 1, sigma 2 as sigma 2 2, sigma 3 as sigma 3 3. And this is by the way, well understood notation. We have been frequently using. Similarly, epsilon 1 has to be actually considered as epsilon 1 1, epsilon 2 as epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 3 as epsilon 3 3. That is also well understood uh, notations that we use frequently in such studies. Now, sigma 4 has to be treated as sigma 2 3, sigma 5 is to be treated as sigma 1 3, sigma 6 is to be treated as sigma 1 2 and epsilon 4 is to be treated as epsilon 2 3, epsilon 5 is to be treated as 2 epsilon 1 3, here epsilon 4 has to be treated as 2 epsilon 2 3, epsilon 5 as 2 epsilon 1 3 and epsilon 6 has to be treated as 2 epsilon 1 2. Now, after understanding this, let us put i equal to 1 over here and j equal to 2 and expand it. So, what happens sigma 1 is equal to c 1 1 epsilon 1 plus c 1 2 epsilon 2 plus c 1 3 epsilon 3 plus c 1 4 epsilon 4 plus c 1 5 epsilon 5 plus c 1 6 epsilon 6. Now, after doing all these things, we have to use this transformation table and substitute the epsilon values. This is the one in the equation and this is what we have to write. Once that is being done, we find that the Hooke's law is followed. So, what I was done with uh, i equal to 1 and j equal to 2, students can do i equal to j equal to let us say 2 and expand and then match.